Hey gang, this is a Larave guitar. It's a D9, which is quite a nice instrument, and we'll be doing some work on this today. The owner emailed me with concerns about the state in which it's in. Um, it's had a few previous repairs done to it, and he wants to make sure those were done well. And he also wants it to play a little bit better, too, if possible. There's some cracks in the top that need inspection and a few other things to do. This instrument has a bit of a mystery attached to it. I plugged the serial number into the Larave website database, and it was apparently made on December the 13th, the year 2000. And the label says California. The funny thing is, they didn't open up that Oxnard, California shop until September of 2001, full nine months later. So, how does that timeline work? I don't know. But it has all the appearances of a 20-year-old guitar. In his initial email, the owner said the action was getting a bit high, and he wondered if it was a candidate for the Kung Fu neck reset. And I told him, no, no. This, that procedure is really only for use on inexpensive instruments as a last resort for making them playable when it would be otherwise economically unfeasible. Um, that's why we get away with it on those kitschy catalog guitars from the 50s. Stuff that is worth less than four to $500 and is never going to increase in value, but which make really interesting players grade instruments, it's okay then. It's not okay on this one. Solid wood guitars made in North America, um, this model retails for $3,000. It would be malpractice for me to suggest that operation for a guitar like this. It's just not right, you know. The professional ethics around repair aren't always fixed in stone, but you do have to balance what's right for both the player and the instrument in question when there are other less destructive ways to handle the situation than just sawing off the neck. The action on this is 6 ths which is about 2.4 millimeters. And that's, you know, it's marginal. A lot of players would have no problem with this, to be honest. It's a medium high, and it's pretty typical for a 20-year-old guitar. The saddle on the treble side has been lowered to the extent that it could be, and I see someone has cut a ramp for the high E string, which is nice to improve the brake angle. If you're a builder, that's something you might consider including in your bridge design from the get-go. Some repair people can do it really neatly, others seem to have a really hard time keeping that line straight, and they can actually mess up your string spacing quite a bit. There are repaired cracks on the top, big ones. This one here near the center seam and another one out here. Those tell me this guitar was exposed to some extreme humidity conditions because Mr. John Larrave is nothing if not fanatical about maintaining proper humidity in his assembly process. It's 42 percent in that room. If it goes to 43 the alarm goes off, everyone has to stop what they're doing, go outside and make the kerf lining or cardboard boxes for a while until it normalizes. So this thing dried out at some point. The scarier cracks are these up here along each side of the fretboard. I'm not sure if they'll catch it, but um, it's right in the corner. Those are the ones the owner's most concerned about, and we do definitely have to check those. The good thing is they don't extend up through the rosette. Um, when you have a guitar with a top that's broken through right to the sound hole, the neck is basically free-floating out there, and it's in real danger of folding up. And sometimes if the damage occurs in a really hot car, for instance, the glue holding the braces in this area can soften enough that the wood of the soundboard actually slides right over them in a process we call creep. Then it cools down again and it will re-solidify in the new position and you have permanently altered neck geometry that can be really tricky to fix. So I'm going to do an operation commonly referred to as shaving the bridge. This could be controversial maybe even hypocritical based on what I said about the Kung Fu neck reset, but I wouldn't do this on a 1930s Martin either. Maybe I can explain it this way. Um, think of a guitar like an automobile. There are parts on a car that just wear out, and strings are like that. Strings are just like tires, or an oil filter, or battery, or brake pads. Um, if someone says, this guitar is all original from 1956, including the strings, you know, you might look at them with some scholarly interest, but you're not going to want to play them for very long. It's the same thing with tires from that era. You take the 56 Buick out on the highway, it's got original tires and brakes, you might not be pleased with the performance, you know? Then you have other parts like the nut and saddle, bridge pins and tuners. These are things that are subject to natural wear or decay at a much slower pace. 
um, but things become really unplayable when they fail. Sometimes they're repairable, sometimes not. Uh, it's like a starter motor or an alternator, fuel lines, rad core. If they're original and functional, that's fine, but if they need replacement on a vehicle that's being driven daily for 10 years, then no one's going to really complain about that. It's kind of expected. I think of shaving a bridge like resurfacing brake rotors. We're removing a small amount of material to ensure optimal performance and extend life before major replacement is necessary. Because a neck reset is a very expensive procedure, not everyone has that money in their pocket. Why wouldn't I shave the bridge on a valuable collector's guitar from the Golden Age? Because most of those bridges were made by hand, and as I've shown in the past in previous videos, some of them have really beautiful inaccuracies baked into the process. They're all a little different from each other. Any North American factory-made guitar uh, from the last 25 years is going to have a bridge like this that was produced on a CNC. They're virtually identical to each other, and in the future, if someone really wanted to go back to original spec, replicating them isn't all that difficult. Um, you'll remember I made a video about it a few months back with a Martin bridge. There are boundaries as to what's possible with this. If a bridge gets too low, you'll lose volume and sustain. On a dreadnought like this one, less than about eh, 9 30 seconds of an inch, 5 16 which is 7, 7.5 millimeters, you get into dangerous territory. It starts to sound a bit anemic. You might go a little bit lower with a small body guitar, but you do need some mass here and some height of those strings above the soundboard to really get the top in motion and get the most out of it. This is um, pretty close to 3 eighths of an inch, uh, 9.5 millimeters at full height. I'm going to take that down to about 5 sixteenths, which will let me drop the action by at least a 64th on the treble side, which is what we need. There's virtually no relief in this neck. It's pretty much perfectly straight. There are some guitars out there that will let you get away with no relief, and they'll play cleanly with a perfectly straight neck. But this one here, I bet you as we start to lower the action, some of these things are going to come into play, and we'll have to do a little bit of fret work as well. There's likely to be a lot of stringing and restringing on this guitar while I work on the setup. So I'm going to hold on to these old strings, coil them up out of the way with a couple of capos here. And that way I can hold off to the very last stages of the process before I put the new ones on. When the current owner bought this guitar, he was given a receipt um, by the previous owner for stuff that was done to it. So this was back in March. Let's see, it had miscellaneous services, humidify treatment. Wow. Structural crack repair, one. Structural brace repair, one. A restring, some strings and they sold them an Oasis guitar case humidifier at the time, which was a good thing. So let's see what goes on in there. Well, wonder of wonders, thanks to the extremely generous donation of my friend Clarence, we've now got an inexpensive bore scope to work with here, and you guys can check things out on the inside with me. And of course, you realize where this is headed, of course. I'm going to have to start up a secondary channel. We'll do some home endoscopies, look out for polyps, and... Um, discuss the devastating effects of colitis. Checking out the work in the lower bout here, I see a lot of glue coming in from those crack repairs and some heavier than I would use cleats, but they are in the right location to support the cracks. There's evidence there for that brace which may have broken or uh, popped free on along its end. A lot of glue there as well. This work was done at one of the locations of Long & McQuaid, which is Canada's largest brick-and-mortar retail store for music instruments. The good news, however, is that those cracks along the fingerboard do not extend through the top. They're, the inside is clean here. The, um, there's the truss rod and the characteristic black marks you'll find on the upper brace in a lot of Larivets, because they require their own special gooseneck Allen key to get in there, otherwise you end up messing it up. But yeah, good news, that spruce is fine. I'll go ahead and mark out for the amount of material I want to remove from the top of the bridge, which is about a sixteenth of an inch, 1.5 millimeters, and I'll do that on both sides as well, because the top of the bridge isn't flat, it's curved. Then I'll take that mark and I'll transfer it across the width, following the natural curve that occurs from the uh, bridge wing sanding operation here. By planing to this line, I'll maintain the look of the original bridge, and uh, it'll give us something that's visually appealing at the end of the day. If you're going to be planing ebony, your blade definitely needs a freshly sharpened edge. 
with the block plane I'll gradually work my way down towards the pencil lines not being in too much of a hurry and I'll stop occasionally as well just to check out the progress and make sure the curves are looking nice. People do sometimes try to use a sanding block to do this and the results to my eye are never really satisfactory. Uh, they tend to look bludgeoned into shape because the block just naturally wants to flatten things too much and round over the corners. And yeah this does require a certain amount of skill to do. Um, here at the end I'm planing the ebony in the way it wants to be cut and just making sure that curve is the way I want it to be. It's really tempting to grab a cabinet scraper at this point because it seems like the tool to use to smooth everything down and fair all those curves. But you have to remember that each of the pin holes here um, the scraper edge will grab hold of it and tend to sort of chatter its way onto the next one, creating a series of furrows or ruts, just like a bad road. And every time you go over them again, that tends to happen and, and gets worse, so it starts to telegraph itself, something you notice. So um, it's far better to use um, a smooth file like this in a draw filing motion. Get that cleaned up and then I can go at it with a sandpaper on a flat block just to um, make things a little bit smoother. Although this surface here is actually not bad as it comes from the plane. I'll go after it with some 400, 600 and 1200 grit paper and some 2400 grit micro mesh being careful to preserve those nice curved lines that I planed. Then I'll follow that up with a quick coat of lemon oil uh, just to consolidate the wings with the freshly planed top of the bridge and uh, I'll wipe off all the excess that will leave us with a nice soft sheen that makes ebony look the way ebony should look. It's pretty sexy. We'll get into the setup here. I removed about a 32nd of an inch from the treble side of the saddle, a little bit more on the base side. So I'll work on the high spots and the frets. Sometimes in an instrument that's been exposed to extremely dry conditions, the fingerboard will contract and especially on a board that's bound like this one, sometimes that's enough to press in on the ends of the frets and actually bow them up in their middles. So you get little high spots right down the center of the board, or conversely the ends of the frets themselves will pop up. In this case both things happen, so I made sure to get some thin super glue under the offending ones there, just to lock everything down in place and uh, make sure that they weren't going to be bouncing up and down under the pressure of my file. Uh, so I get at it with the fret rocker there, figure out where the area that needs to be uh, leveled is, and dress it off with a very fine file. Go slow, check and recheck, and make sure that um, things don't rock anymore. After that I'll recrown these and polish them up to a nice high shine. So it's all strung up. I think the goal in shaving a bridge is probably to have the next repair person have to look at it a few times before they figure it's been shaved down. They won't really know until they get out their rulers. In this case we managed to take down the action by about 17%, which is palpable. Uh, yeah, it's about 5 on the base, slightly less than 4 on the treble, which is nice and comfortable. I'm happy with this.